Yo, what's going on guys? It is JS here, back with another video, and welcome back to the chapter summaries for Fazbear Fright right here. So the Fazbear Fright summary that we are going to be doing today is the real Jake. Now, I'm not going to lie, I will actually give this story a major 10 out of 10. Um, and the reason for that is because, to be honest, it's just so, like... Um, like, it's just so wholesome and everything, and I was watching, you know, Daco's video on it, and, you know, thinking back on it, like he said, it's literally the real Jake has no relation to, you know, Five Nights at Freddy's, like, at all. It's not a type of fnaf story, but I will say, um, you know, spoilers ahead, by the way, that this is the, um, I would say origin story for Jake, and that's what uh, Daco said as well. That this chapter is the origin story for Jake. Now, if you guys do remember a couple chap, or actually a couple books ago, I think when we first met Jake, I think it was, um, I think, yeah, it was a step closer. It was that um, chapter or that book, and uh, I think we met Jake in there. I think I don't know. I could be I could be completely wrong, but let me know down in the comment section below. But yeah. The real Jake is the next chapter, and oh boy, like I said, I will give the story a major, major 10 out of 10. Um, and you'll you'll see why in a bit. But yeah, let's go ahead and get into the story. So the main character, of course, we know is Jake, and I will say this: he is a kid. He is a nine-year-old kid with cancer, and he is, you know, stuck in bed. Like he can't do anything. He's just so weak, and he literally cannot even go and do anything I'm, it's it's so sad and it makes you and whenever i was reading this I, I was feeling so bad for jake because honestly i cannot imagine what he is going through so yeah basically uh jake you know he has a um a character caretaker named margie now if you remember a couple books ago margie was actually in the house um, I think in the secret chapter for Fetch, I believe it was. But yeah, this is the same character from that secret chapter. So, so you know, since Jake, you know, is bedridden, um, he really, really wishes, you know, he could play outside with the other kids because unfortunately, you know, because of how weak he is, he is not able to, um, you know, do anything at all, which is really, I feel so bad for him. So Jake lives in a room um, that they literally describe it as, you know, regrets and also hope or something like that as well. I'm pretty sure that's what it says. Yeah, with so many hopes and so many regrets. So, so Margie is going to get Jake a, you know, a couple crackers and he asks, when is his dad calling? So I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys this now. His dad is in the army, but what makes it, you know, even worse for Jake is that his mother died. Uh, I believe it was whenever he was six years old, but in this current story, he's nine years old. But a couple of years ago, his mom died. So with now his dad in the army, I can't imagine how, you know, like I can't imagine what Jake's going through, you know, especially, you know, a kid with cancer, um, his dad in the army, and then his mom, you know, that has died. I just can't imagine what Jake is going through. Okay, so Simon, they talk about uh, Simon in the page because Jake, you know, he's wanting some crackers and he's like, oh, I just want extra because of Simon. So I'm gonna tell you guys in a bit of what Simon is and you know, how he functions. But yeah, keep keep that in mind when, we, uh, when I talk about Simon. So we learned that Jake's dad is called Evan and I'm gonna go, Margie thinks that, or Margie, I believe, I, I'm, I'm just gonna say Margie, but Margie, you know, she loves Jake like a son. Like he literally, like she literally thinks of Jake like a son. So apparently they have to keep the house, um, you know, very, very hot because even, you know, with anything, cause right now, you know, Jake has a very bad, you know, immune system because you know, the radiation and chemo, um, anything like, you know, with cold can really, really affect him and that would not be good at all. So yeah, Jake has started, you know, chemotherapy and it is not, you know, helping his situation at all. And, and they're trying to, you know, find the right medication, you know, for Jake. So Margie has a baby monitor. So that way, you know, in case, you know, Jake, you know, has any problems, um, Jake can just say, hey, can you come down here? Um, 
you know, and help me with this, and she'll be like, sure, but keep in mind for this baby monitor because it's very, very, very interesting. So basically, Jake, you know, his condition is called peanut or what he says, pine nut. And I'm gonna go ahead, you know, and rate you guys put this part so you guys can understand, you know, what this is. She hit the record button again. Jake has what he calls a pine nut. It's actually a version of the acronym for what he has, PNET, which stands for Primitive Neuroerectermal Tumor. That's a fancy name for a kind of brain tumor. And a specific kind of PNET is a pinostoma. I think that's how you say it. When Evan explained all this to Jake, as best as he could, Jake said, cool, I have a pine nut. And he was barely six years old at the time. I don't think he thinks it's cool now. He's had all the treatments they could throw at this kind of tumor and nothing's working. So yeah, it does say that Jake has had this, you know, this specific type of cancer for three years. And I'm, I'm literally gonna keep saying this over and over again, but man, I seriously cannot imagine, you know, what Jake, you know, is going through. And also any other kids, you know, who are struggling with, like very young kids who are struggling with cancer. Like I just cannot imagine that at all. So what basically this, you know, condition is affecting him with. It's, you know, affecting with his vision and he gets a lot of headaches. And I think, you know, because of all the medicine and stuff, he's like so, like, he's so weak. So it is the, now the nighttime and Margie has already left Jake's room. And now this is where Simon comes in. So basically what Simon does is he, you know, talks to Jake, you know, he, talk, he talks to him. And, you know, if Jake's like all negative, it's like, oh, I had a really good day. Like I wasn't feeling well, but Simon comes in and he's like, no, I want to hear what the real Jake is saying. And that is because Simon wants him to think, you know, of the positive things. He doesn't want him to think of the negative things. He just wants him to think of the positive things, you know, what, you know, Jake would probably do. And he always said this to Jake. It's like, hey, whenever you are feeling better, whenever you are not as weak, and whenever you're feeling so strong, I want you to come find me. And that is literally in Jake's, I guess in Jake's head. It's like, okay, I wanna get better. I really wanna get better so I can be able to talk to Simon. And that's what I wanna do. And what also makes this, you know, so amazing too. And I think I also mentioned in this chapter was like really wholesome. Um, Simon really connects, you know, with, um, he really connects with Jake because, you know, Jake said, oh yeah, I got to play at the, uh, I got to play at, you know, this area. And uh, Simon's like, oh yeah, I got to do that too. So it helps Jake feel a lot better. So the next day, Margie is talking to, you know, to Jake's dad and he, and then, you know, he asked Margie, he's like, hey, how was the chemo? I heard it was rough. And she said, yeah, I, this one is one of the worst. And, and she doesn't understand, you know, how it's supposed to help him when it makes things so much worse. And I totally, totally agree with um, Margie and someone else. And I'll tell you guys later at the end. And then after, you know, Margie talks to um, Evan, Jake's dad for a while, he's like, hey, and oh, <laughs> Margie actually goes into Jake's room and she's like, hey, your dad's on the phone. So, you know, they started talking then. So the next night, Jake has another conversation with Simon and he's like, oh yeah, I went to the movies and I also, you know, ate some popcorn as well. So yeah, and then also, you know, Simon says that as well. So the next night again, Jake talks to Simon and he's like, oh yeah, I had pizza too. You know, along with Simon, and he's like, oh, did you get, you know, pizza sauce on over your face? And Jake was like, yeah, I did. Like I said, all this, you know, with Jake talking to Simon, is just, really really wholesome and also too I'll explain why on you know of you know what Simon basically is so the next day Jake gets a knock on the door from his friend Brandon and he's like hey do you want to go you know to the arcade and Jake is like yeah sure you know I'll be there in a bit so you know because you know he's so bedridden and you know he feels so weak you know he he's literally struggling you know to get um you know, you know, to get changed. And again, whenever I read this, oh my gosh, my, oh man, I just literally can't imagine, you know, how, you know, Jake is, you know, holding up to this. Like it's so amazing. And he even said, it's like, 
yeah, I want to, you know, be the real Jake, and that's what, you know, he says later on. So whenever Jake gets out there in the, you know, in the grass area, he really starts to, you know, not feel well at all, and he just basically collapses and, you know, just completely, you know, vomits all over the floor and you know of course Margie's upset and, and she explains to Brandon it's like hey he really can't go out right now he's not feeling well and yeah she just takes you know Jake back inside so that night Jake you know talks to Simon again and you know he still thinks you know of the real Jake so he still you know tells Simon that I went to the arcade and he's like oh yeah me too me too and yeah basically you know the same thing that he always does so now this is the part where um it kind of explains you know how simon was created and i'm gonna go ahead and read you guys this part margie got a distorted stereo effect as she listened to simon's voice it was coming through the door muffled and it was also coming through the phone she held in her right hand which was positioned next to the backup baby monitor she had held in her hand left hand Margie felt like a little magician, with the magic secrets hidden behind a shimmering curtain. If Jake got out of bed and came into the hall, he'd see how magic how the magic worked. But he wouldn't get out of bed without Margie's help. The secret was safe. It had been Evan's idea, and Margie thought it would be brilliant. Evan called Jake almost every day, and in the first few months after the tumor was found, Jake was receptive to his dad's positive encouragement when Evan said, Keep your chin up, Jake. Keep your chin up. Jake always said rightly, I will, but the sur but when the surgery failed and Jake had to go through the radiation and chemotherapy, he started getting sullen. For months, Evan tried to encourage Jake, and for months, Jake refused to accept the cheer. Evan told Margie that they needed some magic. Jake needed to believe in someone who could pull him out of the horror that was daily life and lead him into the joy of different possibilities. And that's how Simon was born. So basically, what Margie and Evan did they have, you know, Margie has the phone, you know, with Evan, you know, on the phone, and then she has a little radio, and she puts the phone near the radio, and Simon, who's actually in, you know, Jake's closet, which, um, I'll go ahead and say now, it's like, it's literally been, you know, in the house, you know, for many years, Simon can talk to Jake through the closet, and that's how, you know, Jake, you know, is trying to keep, you know, a positive, you know, expression going on or like a positive mind going on. So yeah, that is how, you know, Simon was created. So we also get introduced to a guy named Michael. So Evan describes Michael as, you know, a serious guy and he sounds very, and basically this is what Jake says. He says, so he's like a cyborg with, with bad programming. So, you know, he kind of sounds like a robot a bit, which I'll kind of show you why in a bit. But yeah, I'll uh, explain, you know, how uh, Michael talks in a bit. All right, so this part is where, you know, it also explains, you know, about a thing, which I'll mention later. So Margie, she has like this little project that she has. And what she does is she draws, you know, little markings. You know how I was saying earlier, you know, that they have pizza and the sauce was around their mouth. Well, Margie draws that on the doll so that way when Jake recovers, he will see every single, you know, adventure that he and Simon had, you know, while Jake, you know, was trying to, you know, be the real Jake, you know, while he was trying to recover. And yeah, he, Margie literally draws on the doll, you know, to think of his adventures. And it's just so, it's just so wholesome. And I, I just love it. So Jake has, you know, just had his last you know, two rounds of chemotherapy, but the bad thing is that they're going to be, you know, stopping treatment and they're just gonna have to, you know, manage the systems and whatever, like his symptoms and, oh man, when I when I read that, my heart just absolutely like sank. I, ugh, man, dude, I, I, it's just like, I just, like, I, you know, what I was saying before, it's like, I can't imagine what A, what Jake is going through and also Margie as well because Margie literally thinks as, you know, Jake as like a son to her and, you know, seeing him, you know, go through that probably, you know, it, it it's just, you know, taking a real toll on um, Margie and she also says that she's come to, you know, to love Evan too, but not more romantic, but in a brother way, but either way she still you know feels like she's been you know 
very, you know, much a big part of the family and she basically is, you know, very a big part of the family. So the next day, Margie gets the call that she was not expecting at all. And basically she has been, you know, told that Evan is dead. And Michael tells her that an IED, you know, hit the vehicle that he was in. And you know how I was saying, you know, how Michael, you know, he sounds like a robotic way. Let, let me let me give you an example of how this kind of, you know, happens or how, you know, he says it. I have been notified that Evan's dead. Apparently an IED hit the vehicle he was in. So he kind of says it like, says it's like that in a way. So basically Michael, you know, gives Margie, um, like Evan has a will for Margie and he is Jake's official guardian and he's left her the house and the savings. And I'll, I'll explain more later on about it. So Margie is now really reluctant to tell Jake because, you know, I like, how can you literally imagine like, imagine, you know, being in Margie's shoes and she's like, okay, how can I tell a kid whose mom has died, who, you know, is sick, and then also just learning that, you know, his dad has died. It's just like, I can't imagine, you know, it's just like, you know, it, I just can't imagine, you know, what Margie is going through. It's, oh man, I just feel so bad for them. So she goes to Jake's room again, really, really reluctant on, you know, telling Jake what happened and he's really not getting well at all. And, you know, he's looking really worse, you know, he's just so, he's just really tired. And Margie tells that, hey, just like, you know, Simon will be able to visit tonight, but in all the truth, it's more that, you know, um, his dad, you know, has passed. So this is the part where it gets very interesting, okay? So let me go ahead and read it to you guys. It's very interesting to have your thinking caps on because <sighs> Margie sat up in bed. What was that? In a testament to how little she knew herself, Margie had fallen asleep in the basement lawn chair while the towels were washing. So when she put the towels in the dryer, she went up to bed. Wearing just an exercise bra and shorts, she lay down on the top of the covers on her bed. Her fan was aimed directly at her, but all its warm air could do was tickle the tiny hairs on her arms. Margie had closed her eyes and surrendered to the oppressive oven that was her room. She had fallen asleep almost instantly, but now she was awake again. Had she heard something? Yes, voices. She could hear voices. Light from the outdoor lamp and a three-quarter moon spilled into her room through the open window above her bed. It was enough to eliminate the surface of her nightstand. Where was the baby monitor? Maggie took a breath. She left it in the basement. Leaping out of bed, Margie left her room and padded down the steps of the first floor. Once there, she stopped. She could still hear the voices, but they were barely more than murmurs. She couldn't make out words. She couldn't identify the voices either. Were they male? Female? Was it Jake? If so, who was talking to him? Instead of going down to the basement to get the baby monitor, Margie went to, toward Jake's room. The hallway was dark, but she could feel her way. Running her hand along the top of the dark, Winsicott trimming, Winsicotting trim in the hall, she listened as she approached Jake's room. She thought the voices were getting louder, but once she reached Jake's door, the voices went silent oh okay you're yeah this is something to really really think about think about and i'll tell you guys in a bit so the next morning margie goes to check on jake and he is really you know worse than what he was and he says that his eyes were barely open his skin was almost translucent gray and it was stretched so taut on his face margie could see the perfect contours of his facial bones and his skull Oh man, dude, just, poor Jake, man, poor Jake. So yeah, this is the point where Jake is like, yeah, I'm done pretending. Like he is feeling, you know, really, really bad right now. And you can just like, you know, very see it whenever he says, it's like, I don't want to pretend at all. So the next, or yeah, a couple hours later, Margie, you know, calls the hospice because Okay, if you guys do not know what a hospice is, it's basically a, hold on, let me uh, look it up real quick. Okay, so from what it looks like, it is a center where, you know, people will get the, you know, the right treatment if they're very ill. So she calls up the hospice and, you know, they arrive 
It's like, hey, let's go check on Jake. But ooh, this is where it really pulls your heartstrings. It's it's really sad. Nancy, wait, hold on. The second that Margie stepped into the room, she knew it. She felt it. The room was too still, too empty. Even though Jake's poor, depleted body lay in the bed, Jake was gone. So basically, unfortunately, Jake has, you know, passed on. So I'm going to go ahead and continue reading this for you guys. But listen to, you know, towards the end part. Because Margie turned into a statue in the doorway, Gil Jillian had to practically lift Margie and move her side to allow the EMTs and Nancy to enter the room. Gillian didn't say anything. Margie was pretty sure Gillian knew Jake was gone too. Then Nancy must have sensed it as well, because she frowned. Then she strode to the bed and felt Jake's pulse. She looked up at the EMTs that gave them a slight head shake. They stopped wheeling the stretcher as they both stared at the floor. Nancy looked up at Margie. I'm so sorry. He's passed on. Margie nodded. For once, her eyes were dry. What she was feeling was too much for ordinary tears. What she felt was called a screaming for a screaming fit or a total mental breakdown. Since now wasn't the time for either of those, she had no response to offer. She was a human void. She wanted to fold, her, fold into herself and fall into that void. She wanted to let it suck her from this room, from this reality, but she knew she couldn't escape so easily. So Margie forced her legs to work and she crossed to Jake's bed. His body looked so small and fragile. She leaned over him and pressed her lips to his forehead. I love you, Jake. I love you so much. Bodie tickled her chin. Gillian came behind Margie and whispered, Goodbye, Jake. The three medical professionals wouldn't have had a reason to see anything amiss. For all they knew, it was normal. Even Gillian would not have commented on it. She might have seen it, but she wouldn't attach any meaning to it. Margie thought. Margie would have. But she didn't see. Nobody saw. Five people, five sets of eyes, and none of them noticed the little cabinet door was wide open. There you go. The real Jake. Um, again, that, to be honest, that story was, again, you know, wholesome, you know, because of, you know, how Simon, you know, was connected to Jake and, you know, how Margie was using Evan, you know, through Simon. But at the same time, too, it's also so sad and it gets you really feeling, you know, for both Margie and Jake because Margie is the one who has to take care of Jake and, um, you know, it's just, you know, especially hard on her, you know, after, you know, seeing him, you know, pass on. I just can't imagine what, you know, she has, you know, gone through and also Jake as well. Um, cancer is rough, man. Um, I have had a family member, you know, who's died from cancer and literally current to this day, I am having a, you know, a pug struggling with cancer and it is, it's really rough. It's, it's really, really rough, but I can't tell you for a fact that, um, my dog Rosebud, you know, she's, she's really strong for a pug. So, um, yeah, she is a really, really strong pug. And, uh, yeah, it, the cancer is rough. It really is rough. And, um, I just want, like, at this time, I just want to give the major shout-outs to, you know, all the hospitals, every single cancer research, um, station, you know, trying to research, you know, the cure for cancer, because I do know that it is especially rough, you know. But, anyway, that is the Real Jake summary. So, I hope in next week... I will have, or maybe a couple days from now, I'll probably have hide and seek for right now. But I think today is enough recording for me and I'm just gonna give my voice a little break because you know, recording these summaries, they, they do hurt my voice though, but we will get it done before um, Puppet Carver comes in. I'm super excited about that. But anyway, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.